Find somebody, shake a hand, and welcome them to the house of the Lord this morning. this morning. It is great to see you in the house of the Lord. We've got a good good crowd today on a wet uh, Sunday morning. It's unusual for July to have the kind of rains that we've been having. The Lord's blessing us immensely and we're glad you're here inside the church building today to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and to worship Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord. This is a day that you have made and we're to rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, we've got so many things to be thankful for. We thank you, Lord, for the country that we are privileged to be born and raised and live in today, Lord. And we pray that you'll continue to bless the good old United States of America, Lord, and our president and everybody who has a part in leading and directing the affairs of this nation, Lord. We pray for those who are presently serving in our military. We pray for those, Lord, who have served in the past. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to bless our nation and keep us safe. Lord, we pray that you'd just watch over us, Lord. We know that without you, we can do nothing. But God, with your help, all things are possible. Lord, I pray today, if there's any person here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that this will be the day that they experience what our founding fathers desired, that this nation would be a nation where people could choose themselves personally, God. And I pray today they'll make that choice to receive Christ Jesus as Savior and as Lord. Father, we just pray that your choice is blessing to appear upon this congregation and every family that's represented, Lord. We just pray that we'll feel the power and presence of our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Move in our hearts and move in our lives as we've come to sing and to praise your name and to preach the unsearchable riches of the grace of God. May somebody get saved and saved folks get revived. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated for just a moment. I've got a few things that I need to call your attention to. Most of the announcements have been on the screen. 
and they aren't contained in your bulletin. However, there are a few things I'd like to remind you of. We have, first of all, though I have a thank you card that comes to our church. It comes from Robin and Blake expressing appreciation uh, for the uh, baby shower. It says the baby shower turned out so perfect and we appreciate everyone involved in putting it together. We remember this shower for the years to come and the love that was put into it. Thank you so very much. We can't wait to bring baby Grayson to Corinth to meet everyone, Robert and Blake, and certainly our prayers continue with this family and for the bright, wonderful future that God has in store for them. All right, let's see. Regarding announcements, 5 o'clock this afternoon will be our monthly deacon's prayer meeting here at the church. If you have any object or concern, share it with any member of the deacon body. We'll be coming together this evening, 5 p.m., to go before the throne of grace in prayer. Tonight, 6 o'clock, will be our Sunday evening worship service. On Wednesday evening, we used to meet at 6. The Awanas will meet at 6 o'clock. Actually, the bus is going to leave Wednesday evening. Uh, they're going to Mouse Tail Park, or Mouse, yeah, Mouse Tail Park, to Creek Stomp, S-T-O-M-P. That's what it says. I'm not sure what that is, but I think I did some of it when I was a kid. Uh, I think that simply means they're going to carry the kids over there where they can walk in the water and have a good time. I don't know how many of you were here last Wednesday night, but last Wednesday night we had a celebration of a one in our vacation Bible school. We tried to count them, but they wouldn't stand still long enough. They were wiggling everywhere. So anyway, we don't really know how many folks we had. We had 225 hamburgers and hot dogs, and we had 352 snow cones that were consumed last Wednesday evening. Now, you can just figure that out any way you want to. There's somewhere between 250 and 300 people back here beside the building last Wednesday evening. It was an exciting time, and we give the Lord the glory and the praise for everything that was experienced, that it was a great time in the Lord. Okay, so this coming Wednesday evening, the Iwanas or the bus will leave here uh, for the... Uh, Park in Perry County at uh, 6 o'clock. Bus will leave at 6 o'clock. So if you've got children that want us, be sure you get them here a little bit before 6 o'clock for this coming Wednesday evening. Uh, also, Wednesday evening will be Bible study and business meeting in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. Now, revival is one week away. Where has this year gone? We're back to revival meeting time. Brother Braxton Hunter will be with us in revival meeting. This is, he's no stranger to this congregation. He's been here several times. He and his dad, Harold Hunter, have been here several times in the past. And we have some flyers regarding the revival meeting. They're on the table. As you leave from the vestibule, there's full uh, pages and there's half pages. And Anyway, we'd like for you to help us uh, advertise revival meeting. Uh, give one of these flyers to your neighbors and friends and invite them. He, Brother Braxton, will be here next Sunday morning uh, preaching in this service, 1030 next Sunday morning. He'll be here on Sunday night. Now, the Sunday evening service during the revival, one week away. Sunday night will be at 7 o'clock, okay? We'll do things a little bit different, not 6, but at 7 o'clock. And then Monday through Friday, he will be here at 11 in the morning and 7 p.m. each evening. So... We're looking forward to this great time of revival meeting. The meals list is on the bulletin board. If you'd like to sign up, be a part of that. The list is over there. Dr. Braxton Hunter is the president of Trinity College of the Bible, and he's also president of Trinity Theological Seminary, which has one of the largest enrollments of any seminary in the United States. And we're delighted and thankful that God has... Uh, made available the time scheduled for him to be with us the week of July the 14th through the 19th, Sunday morning through Friday night, and uh, that's just a week away. So anyway, we, uh, we look forward to that. Remember to pray for the revival meeting and pray that God will give us souls for the labor and that we'll truly be revived in the Lord, okay? Hope you had a wonderful 4th of July event this past week. It's been a great week, and we had a great parade, and great event in Washington, D.C., and when I was able to watch it, uh, I came away from that experience proud to be an American. Amen. All right, we will continue the song service.
more splendor than them. Consider the sparrows, they don't plant nor sow, but they're fed by the Master. and a heart full of love. He really cares when your head is bowed low. Consider the lilies and then you will know. May I introduce you of mine who hangs out the stars and tells the sun when to shine and kisses the flowers each morning with the dew but he's not too busy to care about you and a heart full of love. He really cares when your head is bowed low. Consider the lilies and then you will know. Consider the lilies and then Amen. Let me invite you to stand with us as we continue worshiping. Oh, I've heard thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard tender whispers of love in dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're good good father to you are to you are to you are and I'm loved by you to I am to I am to I am oh I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you Who I am Who I am Who I am Sing that You are perfect in all of your ways 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 You are You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. 
back to that third verse love so undeniably I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I can hardly think you think back to that day when you came into that right relationship with God and then and, and that gosh you felt a love that just took you over that you felt you felt uh, and I and I know it's not about feeling but you knew that God came and lived inside of you. you knew that Jesus took ownership of that heart Man, I don't know about y'all. It was it was it takes your breath away to think about that. So I want to ask for a moment. Anybody want to share? Maybe about that time that you came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know, for me, I'm gonna be honest. I was in a music pastor's uh, house. I'd already traveled around the country with a group playing trumpet. Didn't know Jesus, Christian organization. But boy, God just spoke to me that day. So what about somebody else? How's a good, good father came to you?
Sing with me, all the earth. All the earth will shout your Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your that all the earth. That's just like those bones from Ezekiel that he talked about there. Let's just lift our voice. All the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you Lord. All the earth. Let him know. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These songs will sing. Great are you, Lord. Let's lift our voices and just honor Him for being great. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These songs will sing. That it's your bread, it's your bread in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your bread in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, you it's your bread.
Indeed, everybody ought to know my wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and everybody who does know Him ought to bring somebody else to Him. That they too may know Him as their Savior and know Him as their Lord. We're approaching revival meeting time, one week away. Brother Braxton will be here, and I'm excited about it. I don't know about you all, but I'm excited about it. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, the time span in my life. I'm not going to say I'm getting old. I'm just going to say I've been around a long time. His dad and I were neighbor pastors in McMinnville, Tennessee, back in the uh, early 70s. And we've remained good friends ever since then. So I'm working with second generation preachers. Uh, which uh, reminds me, I had a wedding not long ago and I had third generation in that family wedding. So I must have been around a long time. You know what I mean? Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. We are very excited uh, at what God is going to be doing. So I want you to get your Bibles today and turn me in the book of Mark, chapter 9. Book of Mark, chapter 9. One of my favorite chapters, in fact, I've got a whole lot of favorite chapters. All of my chapters in the Bible are my favorite chapters. But among my favorite chapters in the Bible, I love this one. It begins with the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went up to the mountainside and was transfigured before them. And boy, they were having a great time. It was good. I mean, it was good. But at the same time that Peter, James, and John were experiencing the mountain transfiguration experience of Jesus at the bottom of the hill, there was a poor, disappointed father, a dem demoniac child, a demon-possessed child, and a group of nine disciples that had been left behind, and they were not experiencing what Peter, James, and John were experiencing on a mountaintop, they were experiencing an embarrassing defeat because they had tried to heal this demon-possessed child and they could not. So let's pick up, if we may, today with the 14th verse of Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. And when Jesus came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people when they beheld him were greatly amazed and running to Jesus, they saluted Jesus. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answered him and saith, O faceless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought the young man, brought the child unto Jesus. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tired him, and the young man fell on the ground, and he wallowed foaming, and Jesus asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible unto him that believeth. And straightway the father and the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead insomuch that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand. Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and this young man arose. Look at verse 28. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, this kind, this kind, this kind can come forward by nothing but by prayer and by fasting. 
As I mentioned in the beginning, this is a tremendous chapter. It begins with the transfiguration experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he carries Peter, James, and John up on the mountainside. And before their very eyes, the raiment of Jesus became wide and glistening. And during the course of that mountaintop experience of Jesus and the disciples, Moses and Elijah came down. After all, Jesus had told them prior to that experience, He said, there are some of you that are standing right here that shall not taste of death until you see the Son of Man coming in power and in great glory. Now you say all the disciples are dead. You're right. But He said, there are some standing here that shall not die until they see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. Well, give me some explanation. I'll give you the explanation. The Bible says that after six days, Six days after Jesus made that statement that some of you are standing here that will not die until you see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. Six days later he carries Peter, James, and John up on the mountaintop and has this wonderful experience and Moses and Elijah comes down. Now if I were preaching on that text alone I'd preach on a preview of the second coming because that's what they got. They got a preview of the coming power, the second coming of Christ. Moses died, an angel buried him. But here he is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah went home in a chariot of fire. He's one of two men that have lived who never died. There was Enoch who walked with God and was not, for God took him. And here is Elijah that left this old world in a whirlwind of fiery chariots. And both of them, though gone for hundreds of years, are now back down on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses represents the saints of God who've gone before, whose bodies are buried in the grave, but who will be alive when the Lord comes in the power and great glory. I'm telling you, folks, we have a preview of the second coming. Now, it was good. I mean, Sundays were good. That was a good experience. It got so good that Peter, James, and John stood there with their mouths wide open, and they said, Lord, let's just build us three tabernacles. Let's build one for Moses, and let's build one for Elijah, and let's build one for you, Lord, and let's stay right here on the mountaintop. Boy, sometimes on Sundays we have a good time, don't we? I don't know about you, but there are just times out here at Corinth when I get a little foregleam of glory. You say, well, I didn't get anything out of the service. That ain't your, that ain't God's fault. It's our fault when we don't get anything out of it. Brother, if we come with expectancy in our heart, God never lets us down. But Jesus knew, Jesus knew this was no time to build tabernacles and stay on a mountaintop. You know why? Because down in the valley there was a broken-hearted father and demoniac son and nine disappointed disciples. And we have a good time singing the praises of the Lord in the house of God. We have a good time reading the Scripture. And I love preaching the Word of God. I'd rather preach than eat. It's a God-given gift. Got a friend of mine. He claims to have the gift of tongues. He's supposed to be able to speak in some kind of known, unidentifiable language. And we were out one day and he was bragging about his gift of tongues. And I said, well, speak it right now. He said, well, I can't right now. I said, well, I've got a gift of preaching. You want to hear me right now? I'll preach for you. This is good. This is good. But Jesus knew that we're not to stay inside our sanctuary. There is a waiting world out there. And in that world, there's some hurting souls. And Jesus knew at the foot of that mountain, there was a broken-hearted father and a demoniac son and nine defeated disciples. And so when Jesus comes down from the mountainside, evidently there's a glow and a radiance that was still about it. And even the scribes came and they wrapped him up. The crowd came and got all around Jesus and... They were talking to the disciples, and Jesus said, What question ye? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. 
There was one father in the middle of that crowd. He came running up and he said, Lord, I've got a son. He's a mess. He's a demon-possessed mess. His life is a mess. He's a misery to himself. He has a dumb and spirit in him. And wherever this demon spirit takes him, he just flops and falls in the fire. And he's a misery to himself and a misery to the family. And we've done everything that we could do, do to find him some help. And, and I heard that there was a miracle working Jesus around here. And so I brought my son. And you were on the mountaintop. Now I'm paraphrasing this. He said, Lord, you were on the mountaintop, but my son is down here. I brought him to the nine disciples and I asked them to hit him to cast out this demon. And they could not. And Jesus looked at him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I? Suffer you, bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when Jesus saw him, this is verse 20, straight with the Spirit, tear him. And he fell on the ground and he wallowed foaming. That was a bad scene, wasn't it? As soon as that young man with a demon inside of him got near to Jesus, he fell down. I can only imagine what it would have been like. I had a grandfather. who was an epileptic. He would have fits in the middle of the night, chew his tongue, foam and wallows. Now we didn't have telephones, so we couldn't ring a telephone. We had dinner bells. Dinner bells were a signal dinner was ready. I mean, that's why they called them dinner bells, okay? If you just found a mule on the backside of the place and a dinner bell rang, you might not hear, but that mule would hear it. He'd stop. He'd stop. But that dinner bell served another purpose. It was a warning signal in the community. And when Grandpa would lay on the floor in his house, wallowing and foaming and biting his tongue, Grandma had a piece of wood. She'd try to get in his mouth and let him bite on that piece of wood. But she'd also run out to the porch and she'd ring the dinner bell. The coxes who lived down the road, they had a dinner bell. They had to hear that sound in the middle of the night. Now where I lived is the intersection of Interstate 40 and... Used to be 69 Highway. It wasn't like that. When I was a kid, we was 19 miles from Cameron, 19 miles from Parsons. I used to laugh and say we got the Grand Ole Opry, the Saturday night Grand Ole Opry on Monday morning. We really didn't. We got it on Saturday night, but we was a long way from town. But they'd go to ring in the dinner bell and from this house to that house to the other house and then we'd get up and grandpa or daddy would catch the mule and hook it up right quick to the wagon and here we'd go to granddaddy's house. And he was a sight when we got there. You talk about a memory in a child's mind, I remember that. I've never forgotten it. Never forgotten it. This young man was worse than grandpa ever got. Of a child, he had this demon spirit inside him. And when this young man got close to Jesus, my Bible tells me that he fell down flat before Jesus began to wall him to foam. And Jesus looked at the father and said, How long ago since this came unto him? And Jesus said to him, Of a child. And oftentimes it has cast him in the fire and in the water and destroy him. But if thou, if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You know there's a prayer God always answers. You know what it is? A sincere cry for help. His father said, Lord, if thou canst, will you help us? And I love the response that Jesus gives. Verse 23, Jesus said, if thou canst believe. If you can believe all things. I said, A-W-L-O, you know what all means? Hold me, dog. Don't tell me you don't understand the Bible. All means all. It means all in any language, in every language. It means all in the dictionary. It means all on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It means all on the holidays. It means all. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now you talk about an impossible condition. A demon-possessed child wallowing on the ground, falling in the fire, falling in the water. This dad and this mother could not keep, take their eyes off of this child day nor night. 
But Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straight with the father, the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people that came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And when Jesus commanded the demon spirit to come out of this child, the child fell on the ground and was as lifeless as he could be. He quit shaking, he quit foaming, he quit jerking. He just fell down. Totally relaxed. The crowd that always followed him in, round. Said, did you see that? Jesus killed that kid. For he was as though he were dead, the Bible says. And Jesus did what Jesus does best. My Lord Jesus Christ just reached down and got him and lifted him up. Got him and he stood up whole and well and healed. What's got you down in your life? What's made a mess out of you? You say, but we don't have demon possession today. Who told you that? There are demon spirits that possess people in this day. If you don't believe it, you go with me to any one of our re rehab centers. You'll find people there who have life-controlling problems. The spirit of alcohol, the spirit of drugs, the spirit of pornography. On and on the list goes. We got a lot of problem in this country. You know what it's called? Sin. S-I-N. Sin. If you're not possessed by the power of the living God through His Son, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, then the spirit of the devil has already got control of your life. But thank goodness we've got a great physician. Jesus just reached down and got him by the hand and lifted him up. His lift is always an upward lift. He never puts you down lower than where you were, but He always lifts you up from where you are and helps you to become what God wants you to be in your life. Now we've got a shouting father, an astonished crowd, and a bunch of puzzled disciples, and they got Jesus aside and went in the house, and they asked Him a very sincere question. Verse 28. They said, Lord, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said, this kind, this kind, this kind, the hard kinds, the difficult kinds, the ones that others would give up on, the ones that some folks wouldn't even try. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and by fasting. Now we understand what prayer is. It's talking to God. It's just talking to God. We need to be sincere in our prayer life. Not diligent, not give it up. Preached on that last Sunday morning. Diligent, not, not give it up. We don't need self-righteous prayers. We need sincere prayers. Most folks really don't understand this thing about fasting. I want to give you a verse that I'd love. It comes from the Old Testament, book of Isaiah, chapter 58. If you think fasting is only doing that food or drink, and Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was a hungry. He did without food, he did without anything else. That's fine if you want to do this. A lot of folks saying by prayer and fasting and fasting you put on sackcloth and ashes. They put on sackcloth and ashes as a sign of their repentance. It may surprise you what God says that he's pleased with when it comes to the matter of fasting. That's why I'm carrying you to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Look at verse 3. Isaiah 58 verse 3. 
Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our souls, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. You know anybody that ever brags about how long they fast, how much they fast, and they, they try to judge you because you don't do what they do? Look, God don't measure everybody by our yardstick. Okay? He said, there's some of you that fast for debate and strife, and you smite with the fist of wickedness, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is such a fast that I have, is this such a fast as I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? Now look at the sixth verse. Is not this the fast that I, God is speaking, God says, is not this a fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness. Isn't that what it means to get saved? Isn't this the kind of fast that I have chosen that you loose the bands of wickedness to be a soul winner for Jesus every day? Is not this the fast God says that I have chosen? That you loose the bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens, to relieve folks of their burden, their guilt of sin. You've got a burden on your heart today. Jesus can take it away. Amen? To let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? We're a fasting church by God's standards. Can anybody tell me how many tons of rice we give out in Central America? Can anybody tell me how many pounds of lard? And by the way, the last team that went, it got so hot, the lard melted. Now, we may not have a public time when we do without food. We don't look like we've done that much. But I don't know of more fasting church than Corinth Baptist Church. By Bible standards now, that's how to measure things, by what the Bible says. Is, it not, is this not the, the kind of fast that I have chosen, God? To deal thy bread to the hungry, that thy bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, and when thou seest the naked that thy cloak, cover him, and they hide not yourself from your own family. That reminds me of what comes verse 10 after verses 8 and 9 in Ephesians 2. Now we love to talk about Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, it is not of works, lest any man should boast. And verse 10 says, But you're his workmanship, created unto Christ Jesus for good works. You're saved by grace through faith, but you prove that you say that you're saved as you fast and serve others in that fasting. Now, what's that got to do with a revival meeting? You're all fired up about revival. We just come out the 4th of July. We had a good one. I was so proud of our president and what he did the other night. I don't know about you, honey. I got a refresher course in American history. It was good. It was good. You say, well, it costs two million extra dollars. Yeah, and it costs 30 million for the same park service as complaining to celebrate an anniversary recently. So it was pale in comparison. Jesus said this kind, the difficult kind, can come forward by nothing but by prayer and by fasting. Fasting defined under Pluvitz Bible Dictionary says a sacrifice of personal will. Give it up your own personal for God's choice. Your own personal will for His will. They said, Lord, we don't understand this. 
None of nine of us tried to heal this boy, but we couldn't touch it. It was a bad case. It was a hard case. It was a difficult case. And Lord, here you came down and you healed this young man. And Jesus said the reason why you couldn't do it is because this kind comes forward by nothing but by prayer and by fasting. This kind of revival. And that's what we're looking forward to. A God sent, not a worked up, but a prayed down revival. Brother Braxton's a great preacher. He goes all over the country in area-wide crusades. He had a week. God reserved that week for us in his schedule. This kind of revival comes by prayer and by fasting. This kind of church comes by prayer and by fasting. We pray about things and we get busy doing things. I love it. I love it. I love it. This kind of convert. There's somebody in your family, somebody in your life that's hard to reach. I remember Teeny Reeves. His family at that time didn't go to Corinth. His wife and children went to Darden Baptist Church. But later on, they came and joined Corinth Baptist Church, and for a number of their last years, probably 10, 15 years of their life, they were members here at Corinth, faithful members. Teeny met Miss Jewel down in Mississippi. I don't know if she knew this or not, but I heard him give his testimony. He met her. She was working in a cafe, truck stop cafe type thing. He met her down there, married her, brought her from Mississippi back to Darden, Tennessee. I don't remember, I think they had when they had four boys and two girls. Anyway, on the Sundays whenever we'd have Mother's Day and we'd have the most children and all that, you know, it was, it, she, pretty, well, she pretty well got the flyer every time, you know what I mean. But Brother Taney wouldn't go to church with him. He drove a truck, he was too busy to go to church. She prayed, she prayed and fasted. She prayed and kept carrying the kids to church. She prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. I've heard Brother Teeny give his testimony that one day he was driving a truck, hauling gravel, prayer and fasting. And something got in the cab of that old truck with him. It was the power of the Holy Spirit and conviction in his life. And he got saved driving down the road. <laughs> pulled into Darden, pulled over the side of the road and ran. They always had this nice garden between the house and the road down here. He jumped out of his truck, ran through the middle of the garden. Hold up, say, don't say, don't say, I'm saved. I wasn't their pastor at the time, but I heard about it. I mean, that was the talk of the whole area around here that Teeny Reeves had gotten gloriously and wondrously saved driving down the road in his gravel truck. Prayer and fasting. Who do you know it's hard to get here? Pray for him. Give up a little time, a little effort. Carry him a flyer. Tell him about Jesus. Invite him to the revival meeting. Invite him to church. Break him to die. Get a head start. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and by fasting. One last verse I want to put on the screen. It's almost time to give the invitation. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. You want revival? Do you hear the condition? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Is that what you want? Is that what you really desire?
If it is, we can have it. God's already made the promise. He put the conditions before us. It's left up to us now to pray it down. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. Lord, we know that if you could handle the case that a demoniac son, a demon-possessed young man, who fell in the water, fell in the fire, and wallowed foaming, if you could handle his case, you can handle ours. Lord, we're not in that bad a physical shape, but Lord, there may be somebody here today, while not possessed by the kind of demon spirit it was in this young man, yet, Lord, they're controlled by some kind of demon spirit that tells them they've got plenty of time. Put it off one more Sunday. Put it off one more day. Put it off one more hour. Lord, I pray today for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to fall upon this congregation, Lord. If there's anybody here, Lord, that's not saved, does not know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, may they come to realize that they're not too far gone, but that Jesus can reach down and touch their hand and lift them up. Forgive their sins and heal them. Set their feet on a solid rock and point them in the right direction. Empower them from this moment on for Christian service. Lord, I'm praying for the lost to come and get saved. God, if there's any saved folks here that's in a cold, backslidden condition, Lord, I pray that today will be the day when they hear the call. If my people which are called my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, repent of their wicked ways, God says, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. So Lord, today's the day that we give an invitation for the unsaved to get saved and for the saved folks to get out of business. You've given us a ch second chance to redeem our nation. We give you thanks and praise and glory for it, Lord. Help us to do our part to bring this nation back to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together, stand together. As we sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Have you experienced that grace of God? If you haven't, you can. And you're encouraged to do it and do it now. If you're a saved person and there's a burden on your heart for revival, for a family member, for a neighbor, for a friend, for Right.
wonderful hymn of invitation written by a person who had just found Jesus as his Savior and his Lord. I was blind when I was saved. I was lost, but I've been found. Is that your testimony? If it isn't, it can be before you leave here today. The official public invitation, the singing has come to an end. Okay? But the invitation is still out there. If you're lost, please don't leave this building until you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive Him as Savior and as Lord. I do a lot of funerals. The next one may have your name on it. If you die lost. No, by the way, you've got a 50-50 chance of living through the day. Did you know that? If you die lost, you will have sealed your doom for all time and all eternity. Don't take the chance. You're dismissed unless you're not saved. If you ain't saved, hang around. Okay, let's pray.